Well, good evening and uh, welcome. It's good to see everybody here in person. It's a great joy, isn't it, to actually be together and to be able to see one another's faces, albeit covered with a mask still. We're very aware that we're here in Wales and still needing to wear masks in public places. When we sing tonight, we are able to sing, which again is a, a great joy to sing together. But once again, we have to sing with our masks on. But all of that shows that things have improved greatly and a great change from last year. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. It's a, a great delight to be able to live stream. And so we know that we're welcoming you from many different places. So wherever you are this evening, a warm welcome to this ABBA conference. A conference, um, yes, it is a conference, not as we know it, but certainly a conference together. Thanks to the church family here in Christchurch. Thank you so much for welcoming us and allowing us to, to use the building here. We were looking for a very big room to meet in, so as many of us as possible from the South Wales area could come together and meet in person. And uh, the friends at Christchurch have been uh, a real joy to work with, and they've warmly opened their hearts and welcomed us here, and we really do want to thank you for all that you have done. Your hospitality is just uh, so, so joyful and so warm. And so thank you so much for all that you've done to make it possible for us to meet here and to come and make all the preparations that we needed to, to. Welcome to those of you who have come in person and welcome to our main speaker for this week, for these three evenings, for Dr. Sinclair Ferguson. We're so grateful to him for making the journey down from Scotland and not only has he journeyed here from Scotland, but he's also going to see most of Wales because we will be traveling uh, through mid Wales and then on to North Wales, ending up in Mould on Thursday evening before our brother will be able to travel back to Scotland on Friday. So welcome and thank you so much for being willing to come and to preach uh, for us. When we first invited Dr. Ferguson, we didn't know what would happen, where we would be, what we'd be able to do. But we are here, and for that we thank the Lord. Let's turn to Lamentations chapter 3, and I'll read from verse 19. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 19. We know that we haven't experienced the destruction of Jerusalem as Jeremiah did, we haven't been through all the afflictions that he went through, but we have been through a time of affliction and trouble. It's been very humbling for all of us over the last year. And I'm sure that what Jeremiah says here is something that we find echoed in our hearts. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it, and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Shall we come to God in prayer? Let us all pray. O Lord, God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow in your presence coming humbly to the God who made the world and everything in it, the God who has given us life and breath and all things richly to enjoy. You are the God who satisfies the longing soul and you fill the hungry soul with good things. And we come here tonight, 
or we watch online and we find ourselves hungry in our soul and we long that you would satisfy our longing souls. We come to eat, we come to drink at the fountain, we come to feed upon the living bread, we come to hear the words of life that will sustain us, strengthen us in our soul. You have brought us through many troubling times, but we thank you that you have been with us. There has been much sadness and loss, and we do remember all who are sad in their hearts, all who mourn. But we thank you that you have brought us to this point, and we are able to say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Be with us this night, we pray. We ask that in all that we do, in our singing, and in the reading of your word, in the preaching of that word, that you would receive all the glory and the honor. And we ask that we might go from this place being glad that we have met with the people of God, but more importantly, that you, the living God, has met with us. So deal with us, we pray, in grace and love and mercy, for we bring our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah says, Great is your faithfulness. Our first hymn this evening is, Great is thy faithfulness.
Each night this week, we're going to take the opportunity to talk to Sinclair about some of the books that he has written. There are many, many books that he's authored, and I'm sure that many of us here and, and watching have benefited greatly and been blessed by the books. The book that we're going to look at this evening is called Discovering God's Will. Discovering God's Will. I wonder if I can ask, uh, ask you here, how many of you have read this book, Discovering God's Will? Some of you have, good. If you haven't, I want to really thoroughly recommend it to you. It was first published in 1982, but it's still in print today. I don't know how many other books are still in print after 40 years, but this one is. And so I want to encourage you, if you've never read it, it's not very big, it's, uh, you can read it very comfortably in just a few hours, but I think you'd want to spend a bit more time on it than that, because each chapter uh, deals with discovering God's will. And it covers many things, your calling in life, marriage, question mark, and uh, the fact of how we should live, principles of, of conduct, and so on. So it's a great book. I remember reading it a long time ago, thinking that I was going to discover the secret of guidance. Instead, I found something far more precious in this book. I hope you will too. So can I ask Sinclair, would you mind coming up? And I'm going to ask you something about it. If you'd, you'd mind standing on this side. Thank you very much. So, um, so I really would mind coming up since I'm the author of the book. It's I know. a bit embarrassing I, I, to I, I, I have do. product placement. I understand that. Yes, that's right. But this is, this is why I asked you to, to do this. Because I asked you if you would tonight choose a book that has some special significance to yourself. And you immediately chose Discovering God's Will. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came to write this book, if you can remember 40 years ago? Yeah. Well... If it was published 40 years ago, I was obviously still in elementary school <laughs> when, when I wrote it and not knowing very much about what the book was about. But it began life actually as an address I gave at a conference for young people sometime in the 1970s. On, I was asked to speak on choosing your life calling. And somebody said to me, you should turn that into a booklet. And um, whatever year I wrote it in, uh, my wife was expecting, I think, our fourth child, and as the responsible husband who had arranged to go off to a conference, I said to her in a moment of weakness, would you rather I stayed and didn't go to the conference? I wasn't speaking at the conference, I was just going to the conference. She said, yes, I would. It wasn't that she really needed me. She did not need me for giving birth to children. But I found myself with a, basically a week on my hands where my the program of my life mm. had been emptied, really. And I thought, maybe I should write up that address. Mm. And that was where the book started. But like Topsy, it just kept on growing. And so it has a special significance for me because of that connection on the one hand, but also by the end of the week, really, within, by the next, by the next Monday, I handed the manuscript to the publisher. So it was written... I mean, some people who have read it may have thought the guy must have written this in a week, but it, it, I think of all my books, it felt like the book that was most just given to me, providentially given to me. Yes. And then when I started writing, um, I just kept on writing, and it kind of it grew as books do. Mm. Um, so it's been a, been a kind of special a book child in my life. Yes. But the fact that it's still in print today, and as far as I can tell, you haven't edited it, updated it, that says something about the book. Why do you think it's still in print? There's a, some, some books go um, get outdated, don't they? they? They have this sense of belonging to a particular era. But this doesn't. Why do you think that is? I'm not the best person to ask, really, Jeremy, but I suspect um, views of guidance are like swings and roundabouts. There's always somebody with a thing 
mm. and publishes or does the seminar, and we all latch on to it. Um, but that book is, not, is deliberately not like that. Um, it is really a book about the basic principle that our guidance for giving, for living the Christian life, and for making the big decisions involves the single principle of how do we take the Word of God, which applies to specific situations, and apply that to the situations in which we live, so that in receiving God's guidance, we don't do a run down the outside byline to get special messages from God mm. when He has actually given us the truth that we need, the sufficiency of Scripture that Paul speaks to Timothy about in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And that's why the chapters are, yes, about things that people really feel they need God's guidance, mm. but why you didn't discover God's will when you read the book, because it's really about this is what God wants us to do as we seek His will. Because yeah. he's, and it's interesting to me because I'm, a, I'm something of a student of the history of theology, that books on guidance are relatively recent phenomena in the history of the church because in past days that might be thought of as better days, uh, people were on the one hand taught how to live under the providence of God and taught the Scriptures well enough to be able to bring together the teaching of Scripture with the providences of God in their own lives and to make sense of God's providence and leading. Mm. So that, you know, unless your name is Eve or Mary or Bathsheba um, and uh, somebody is thinking about marrying you, the name of the person you are to marry is not found in the Bible in that way. So, what mm. you need to do is to take the principles that are found in the Bible and apply them to the providential circumstances and situations of your life. And um, yeah. that's, to some people, much more challenging than the quick drop from heaven. Yeah. And so long as you believe in the quick drop from heaven, you're almost certain psychologically to seek that as your authority rather than the lifelong task of grounding yourself in Scripture so that discerning the Lord's will becomes somewhat instinctive to you. And I yeah. think in the book, if I remember, there was something John Newton wrote that I thought was very helpful, where he says, this is a bit like uh, someone learning to play the piano. It's hard work but the more you do it, the more you become familiar with the keys and the music, uh, and you watch the pianists who have that level of ability, it just seems to flow out of them. And in, at the end of the day, the place we want the Bible to be is in our minds and in our hearts, so that when we see what is happening in our lives, we have the instinct to discern which way we should go. So that's really what the book was about. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that. So I recommend that thoroughly to you. Yes, I, I didn't discover immediately God's will for my life, but I did discover that it's hard work, but the principles of Scripture are there to be worked out and to be applied in our lives. And of course, because the principles of Scripture are timeless, I think the book has a timeless quality to it. So if you've never read it, please be encouraged to, to get that. You can see uh, on the screen... Uh, that you can go to the EMW bookshop, online bookshop, and you can even get a 10% discount as well if you'd like to order the book online, and many other books there as well. Well, um, this book begins and ends with a chapter based around the Lord's My Shepherd, Psalm 23. And we're going to have a, a children's talk video now, just for about four minutes or so, which is also based around Psalm 23. The Lord's My Shepherd, part one. Right in the middle of your Bibles is a big book called Psalms. I don't know why there's a P there, but in it there are 150 songs. And for the next three days, 
I want to talk about the one that comes just after 22 and just before 24. That's right, it's Psalm 23. The man who wrote this was a man called David, who was the king of Israel. But the first job was less glamorous. He spent his days looking after his father's sheep. And this song he wrote is all about a shepherd. Being a shepherd wasn't an easy job. It's not like in the Christmas concert when you have a tea towel on your head and your granny's walking stick and a toy sheep under your arm. It was a scary job. You worked all day making sure the sheep had enough food and making sure these animals who weren't very clever from getting themselves into trouble. And you had to protect them from wild animals like lions and bears. Good shepherds were hardworking, dependable and brave. They even risked their lives to protect the flock. So David knew all about what it meant to look after the sheep. And what he does in this psalm is compare his Lord Jesus to a shepherd. He starts his song with these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. The Lord is my shepherd. Even in that one sentence, there are two amazing things. He described the Lord Jesus, who is God himself, as a shepherd. David was living before Jesus lived, and yet he knew and trusted God. When Jesus was preaching, he told people that he was the good shepherd. You see, David knew his God was not as someone far away in the sky, but as a shepherd, someone who cared for his people. Someone he could trust. David calls him my shepherd, not a shepherd, not the shepherd, but my. Is there someone you call my? My friend, my brother, my mum. Someone that you have a special relationship with, that you call your own. They belong to you and you belong to them. Well, David is able to say that about Jesus. He calls him my shepherd. Do you know why Jesus calls himself the shepherd and us his sheep? Not because of the sounds we make. Not because we're smelly like sheep. Not because we're woolly like sheep. But because of what he is like. He cares and protects for his people. One of the main jobs of the shepherd is to feed the sheep. Sheep don't go to the supermarket or to restaurants to feed themselves. The shepherds make sure they have food. David says because of Jesus, he lacks nothing. Everything that he needs is provided for. The good shepherd gives us everything we need. Not everything we want, but everything we need. And he refreshes us. Have you ever been really thirsty? Maybe it was a hot day and you'd been running around like mad. You sat down, wiped the sweat from your forehead and had an ice cold drink. What a refreshing feeling. That is exactly what I needed. Jesus gives us that refreshment for our lives. He refreshes our souls. If you put your trust in Jesus, it's like a drink on a hot day. You'll say, that is exactly what I needed. But unlike when we are thirsty and we need to drink again, Jesus is enough to refresh us forever. What have we learned so far? David is able to call Jesus his shepherd. Jesus cares for his people. He gives them everything they need. He refreshes not just their thirsts, but their souls. We'll find out a bit more tomorrow. Now we're going to have our Bible reading and prayer, and I invite Bernard Lewis to come and to read to us. Bernard, up until recently, was pastoring here in uh, Newport. Thank you, Bernard. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I have to admit that when Jeremy sent me the details of the order of service for this evening and um, mentioned that discovering God's will was going to be reviewed, it, I found it a wonderful providence because it is the first book that I ever read of uh, Dr. Ferguson's, and um, it met me in uh, a real, if you like, crisis point in my life. 
The second book that I remember reading of his was while I was on home assignment and probably going through quite a challenging time in my Christian experience. And uh, that book was Deserted by God, um, question mark. And as I read that book, I realized that I had met a man who was a pastor who understood the struggles of my walk with God. So, if you've got enough to buy two books, I'd recommend both Discovering God's Will and Deserted by God. Uh, You won't um, find that they are a waste of money, but they are a true blessing. Let's turn to God's Word now. It's recorded for us in Genesis chapter 50, uh, 50, and we will read the verses 15 to 21. Genesis 50, verse 15, let us hear the Word of God. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So, do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Thank God for his word. Let's draw near to him now in prayer. Let's all pray. Eternal and ever-blessed God, we come into Your presence tonight, and we thank You that You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We thank You, Lord, that You are the God who created us and who has led Your people throughout history. We thank You, too, O gracious God, that You are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the one that you sent into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We come to you tonight, O gracious God, and we thank you that uh, with your Son, our Savior, you gave to us the Holy Spirit who would lead us into all truth, who would indeed give light to your Word and would give new life to those that you have called to be your children. Lord and God, we come to you tonight and we rejoice in your wondrous grace. We thank you for your mercy to us. And Lord and God, we come tonight thanking you for this wonderful testimony of Joseph, that he was able to answer his brothers in such a gracious way because he knew that he was not in the place of God. Um, Lord, we come to you tonight, and we thank you that we need no substitute. We need no uh, mediator apart from our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to you with great thanksgiving, and we seek to honor you, to praise you, and to glorify you, not only tonight in this meeting, but in our lives. Help us, O Lord, to uh, keep in step with your Spirit. Help us, O gracious God, to uh, apply the truths of Your Word as we were hearing in that review earlier, so that, Lord and God, every part of our life 
might be directed by you. Father, we come to you tonight at the beginning of this short conference, and we pray that we would be made aware of our God. We pray that your Spirit would uh, work in our midst tonight, that we would be given understanding of your truth, and that, Lord, in that understanding, we would turn to you and rejoice in you. We would indeed give you glory for your goodness and grace to us. We pray not only for this evening, but we remember the meeting tomorrow in Aberystwyth and also um, the meeting on Thursday in Mould. Lord, we pray for uh, all who will be traveling, not only uh, the speakers and leaders, but those who will be responsible for all the tech in the ministry that we have in these days. Lord, would you keep them as they make these journeys, and may your grace be with them, we pray. We come to you too, O oh, gracious God, and as we pray for ourselves, we pray for our nation. Lord, would you be merciful? We pray for the world in which we live, which uh, is facing terror in so many situations, the, the wildfires in some contexts, um, civil unrest, and um, persecution in others. Lord and God, would you be merciful, we pray. And tonight, as we continue in your presence, we just ask that uh, our brother Sinclair would know your help and that we would hear your voice, and that, Lord, we would leave tonight knowing that it has been good to be together and to be under the sound of your Word. So, hear us now. Be gracious to us as sinners. Forgive us, cleanse us, refresh us, and help us to honor you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we hear the Word of God preached, we'll sing again, and our hymn is, When I fear my faith will fail, he will hold me fast.
Well, let me say to you, first of all, that it is a delight to be back in Wales again. Um, I very rarely, alas, visit Wales, but it's always a treat to visit. Um, and in the past, it's been a very special privilege to be at the Aber Conference um, and to enjoy a, the fellowship of God's people and, of course, especially the singing of God's praises. And Aber Light um, is a rather different kettle of fish, if that's not a mixture of metaphors. Um, I'm very glad to be with you. Um, but I want, first of all, to explain to you what I want to try to do on these three evening occasions, just in case anyone, uh, apart from Bernard and Jeremy and myself, happen to hear all three messages. Um, I have an overarching theme for the three nights, and three essentially standalone messages that fit into that theme. And the theme, if I may take a minute, um, just for those of you who may uh, be present to hear more than one of them, to explain the theme that joins them together. I'm going to call it Grace from the Inside. And the thought is this, that in the Scriptures, um, when you read the narrative of an individual and God's dealings with them, customarily that narrative is told from the outside. The central figure is he or she. And Bible scholars have a term they use for the person who tells the story. They call him the omniscient narrator, not because he's omniscient, but because the only reason he's able to tell you the story is because he knows how the story ends. So, while he's telling you the story and you're reading the story, if you're reading it for the first time, you have no idea where the story is going to end. He knows, and he plants into the story indications like some great novelist would do of how the story is going to develop and end that make you go back to these little details and say, oh, now I see what God was doing. But there are some of these stories in Scripture, some of these biographical narrations in which the individual interjects himself, and he will describe, perhaps in the middle of the experience, usually after the experience, what it was like from the insight. Not every biblical biography works that way, but what ties our three messages together this week is the fact that I've chosen three individuals in Scripture who exemplify in their experience different aspects of the character and grace of God in the lives of His people, and who will tell us, as it were, from the inside what it was like to be the recipient of that grace. And I think you would recognize immediately from our reading here in Genesis chapter 50 that the first of these characters is Joseph. And in fact, I've chosen three very well-known passages and three very well-known stories to try to make this point that when we experience God ourselves, we experience His grace on the inside. And of course, in different individuals, there may be very special aspects of that grace that impress themselves upon us and eventually, as often happens, will lead to the particular shape and fruitfulness of our service of the Lord. And as I say, I think it's very obvious when we read this very well-known story of Joseph that Joseph is someone who comes to experience the grace of God from the inside very slowly so that eventually he is able to give testimony to the amazing detailed sovereignty of God's providence in his life. Now, 
I guess, like some of you, I was not brought up in a church going home, but I was brought up so long ago that the one spiritual book that I recognized in our house was our, my grandmother's Bible, a grandmother I had never met. And as a child of four, my mother having taught me to read, she'd probably be banned from elementary school for trying to do it to her own child these days, but having taught me to read, and also that I was smart enough to have invented my own central heating system, because we had a house without central heating, that when my parents got out of bed in the morning, I jumped into their warm bed with my granny's Bible, and there were a couple of stories I loved to read. One of them was the story of Daniel, which was hard to find because it was so far along, although I recognized the name Daniel. And the other, interestingly, was the story of Joseph, which was hard to find because there isn't a book of Joseph. And I used to read and read again this extraordinary, marvelous story of the life of Joseph, beginning when he was a late teenager, age 17, and going on until he is prime minister of all Egypt, and in a sense, humanly speaking, the savior of the whole area around the Mediterranean. And I didn't realize then that in a rather amazing providence of God, He was getting me to read again and again and again the story that would prepare me for perhaps the most frequently asked question I've experienced in pastoral ministry, namely, why is God doing this in my life? Appears in a multitude of different forms. What's the explanation of this? Does God not love me anymore? Why is this happening to me? Why does God not do something different? so much so that I came to think privately of that question as the Joseph question, because we can surely have very little doubt that during the dark days of his life, Joseph must often have been asking the question, what is God about in my circumstances? Now, the story with which you're familiar is it's almost like a great symphony, isn't it? It's divided into these four sections. Joseph appears as a bright but brash teenager. He ends up being put down a pit and sold as a slave into Egypt. He finds himself, as it were, in the second movement. Uh, If he's rejected in the first movement, then he is disappointed in the second movement. He becomes, as it were, the right-hand man of the man in whose life he has entered as a slave and everything is in his hands. Potiphar leaves everything in his hands until he discovers that Joseph has left his cloak in his wife's hands, and he moves from this situation of rejection in the first movement to a situation of desolation in the second movement. And there in jail, he reveals the meaning of the dreams of the butler and the cupbearer, the baker, and finds himself deeply disappointed that though they come true, he is left languishing in prison. And then comes the movement we might call exaltation, when he finds himself brought up from the prison, presented to Pharaoh, explains Pharaoh's dreams, becomes prime minister of Egypt, his right-hand man. And then the final movement in these closing chapters that we might call reconciliation, when through a long series of events, partly masterminded by Joseph himself, the whole family arrives in Egypt, and this profoundly dysfunctional family finds itself, father and brothers, reconciled to each other. It is surely one of the most beautiful stories in all of Scripture. And yet, when the story ends with these words that uh, Joseph is brought up from Egypt in a coffin, 
we're given this sense for all that we have seen the wonder of God's providence, the story is not yet finished, and there must be more to come. And indeed, if we've read sufficiently in the book of Genesis, we know that this is only part of the story. And as I think we will see later on this evening, it is a part of the story that leads to a much greater conclusion. So, this is the story. It's the story of a man, if I can put it this way, who finds that his life is like a crossword puzzle or a jigsaw puzzle that has been thrown out of the box. There are all these pieces that do not seem to make sense. And slowly as the narrative unfolds, the pieces are put into place, and the picture begins to become clear, and we see how God Himself in His sovereign providence is actually at the center of everything that Joseph experiences. I don't do jigsaw puzzles. Actually, I don't do any puzzles. They're all now too challenging for me, and I can hardly bear the defeat. But my wife does jigsaw puzzles. And if they're rectangular, she always looks for the four corner pieces. And from those four corner pieces, the picture begins to take shape. And I think we can say, by way of analogy, the same thing about Joseph's life. There are four corner pieces, four principles that we find in this narrative that I think we can apply to every single one of our lives as we seek to discern the answer to the question, what is it that the Lord is actually doing in my life? And they are, I think, very important principles. The first is this, that God is always working in a variety of circumstances. Joseph is portrayed right from the beginning until he becomes prime minister as a man who is isolated from others, isn't he? And when you go through difficult experiences that do tend to isolate you from others, the question that you inevitably ask is, what is the meaning of this. And I think one of the things we learn from Joseph's story is that so long as we keep asking that question, we will never actually find the answer because the this does not exist in isolation from God's larger purposes. And this is what we discover in Joseph's story. Um, in a way, it's like some of those quiz shows where they'll, they'll show you a photograph of somebody, perhaps an eye or a nose, and, and you're supposed to try and guess who it is, and usually you fail until other pieces begin to be put into place. You can't recognize the identity of the person just from one part of their anatomy normally. And exactly the same is true of the purposes of God. They are far bigger, as it were, than one moment in our lives. And as the narrative unfolds, Joseph seems lost, that's for sure. And the other thing that is for sure is that God seems to be very, very slow indeed. Fourteen years pass from Joseph being a teenager blurting out his dream at the breakfast table to Joseph becoming prime minister of Egypt. Another fourteen years will pass before he has, as it were, man-mastered the crisis in the Middle East. It's a long story. And there are times when God must have seemed very far away, and Joseph must have felt lost. And if God was doing anything, Joseph must have felt, as we often feel, why is God so slow? And yet, as the omniscient narrator tells the story, it makes clear two things. The first is that God was always with him. And he actually pinpoints that, doesn't he? In chapter 39, he says it three times. 
the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Later on in the story, when Joseph brings his sons to be blessed by uh, Jacob, his father, you remember Jacob crosses over his hands to bless them, but his blessing begins by saying, may the God who has been my shepherd all my life bless these boys. So, it wasn't David who first said, the Lord is my shepherd. It was Jacob, the twister, who had discovered that the Lord was his shepherd. He was with him. And at the end of the day, as Jacob looked back, as the omniscient narrator tells the story, as Joseph eventually discovered, at the end of the day, that is the one thing that really matters, that even when I cannot see my way, I know that He is with me. That's what Psalm 23 means to us, even though I walk through the valley of deep darkness, I will fear no evil because you are with me. I remember when I worked in the United States listening to a Christian radio program when I was driving somewhere and almost went off the road when a a, a listener told a story about her her, her husband's great physical need, and the, the person who answered the question, what your husband needs is a miracle of healing. And I shouted out through my windscreen, that's not what he needs. He needs to know that the Lord is with him, whether it be miracle or no miracle. And this is what the omniscient narrator says about Joseph, that even if he felt lost, the Lord knew exactly where He was. And that sure is a great strength to us to be able to say, Lord, I have no idea where I am, but wherever I am, I know this. You are Emmanuel. You are with me. And although God seemed slow, the fact was that His timing was perfect. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that when you do the sums, there are inclusively 14 years from Joseph foolishly blurting out that they're all going to bow down to him, and the day he is exalted in the court of Pharaoh, 14 long years of struggle to teach him patient endurance and then fourteen long years, having learned patient endurance to hold the reins of the Middle East so that it may be supplied with food. And you begin to see it. It took fourteen years to make David the kind of man who would have that kind of endurance. And so, though God seemed slow, God's timing was absolutely perfect. I think that's true in many Christians' experience, isn't it? Perhaps some of us even today, we feel, I don't know how many Christians, including ministers, have told me about how they feel that somehow or another they have been, they have been shunted down a side street and removed from the center of fruitfulness. And it strikes me that in the case of Joseph, God was using what I call the cul-de-sac principle, where He brings His people out of the mainstream of traffic, and despite their frustrations, He keeps them there until His place in the traffic has arrived, and He moves them into that place now as different men and women who are now forged in such a way that they will bear rich fruit. And so it was in the life of Joseph. God seemed slow, but His timing was perfect. Joseph seemed lost, but the Lord was with him. It's like the 77th Psalm, isn't it? Or William uh, Cooper's hymn, God Moves in Mysterious Ways. He plants His footsteps in the sea. 
the problem with footsteps in the sea, the psalmist says, is that they cannot be seen. And so it was for Joseph. He couldn't see God's footsteps, but his purposes were sure. He was holding Joseph fast. He was preparing him for future fruitfulness. So, this is the first corner piece in our thinking, that God is always working together a variety of circumstances. And so long as we focus only on one, we will never be able to see the big picture, and we may end up resisting the Lord's gracious providences. The second principle is like the first principle, really, isn't it? And that is that God is always working in a variety of people. Now, what's the question I ask? The question I ask is, God, why are You doing this to me? Why is this happening in my life? And it's really the wrong question, isn't it? Because what God may be doing in your life may only in a secondary sense be about you. It may actually be about what He means to do with you for others. And this is what happens with Joseph, isn't it? His dreams are shattered. I I can imagine him saying to the Lord, because he surely believed the Lord had given him these dreams. And and we believe the Lord had given him these dreams, although in the mystery of God's providence, He hadn't given him the wisdom to handle the dreams, and yet used Joseph's unwisdom to fulfill the dreams. It's an amazing story of the comforts of knowing that He will hold me fast, just as we have been singing. And if he said, Lord, why are you doing this to me? The answer would be, as the story unfolds, Joseph, it's not just about you. It is about you. But you need to understand that what I'm doing in your life is not just for your sake. It's for the sake of others. And you see it as you're familiar with the story, how progressively God untwists Jacob, the twister, even by means of Jacob, who had been the deceiver, being himself deceived. It's almost as though God employs a kind of homeopathic medicine on His people. He gives them, as it were, a taste of the sickness that's emerged from them in order to cure them of that sickness. And here in the case of Jacob, you see the the man who had, who had repeated his own parents' foolish error and made Joseph his favorite and then made Benjamin his favorite. And as God has been working in the life of Joseph, what he has had an eye on is the fact that Jacob needs to be willing to lose Benjamin in order to be reunited to Joseph and to be reunited to all of His other children. And we could say something similar about the brothers. It's very interesting as the story unfolds in in chapter 42 in a couple of places, when they they have encountered Joseph, and then they discover that they have been they have been exposed by Joseph. They don't know He knows more about them than they know, and He exposes them, and they begin to say this, then they said to one another, this is chapter 42, verse 21, in truth we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And then they say, what is this that God has done? And they slowly discover themselves being brought back, ultimately, to reconciliation, but only because they've seen their sin and they've begun to repent of it. And 
in Egypt, if Joseph was saying, God, why are you doing this in my life? He could not possibly have had the capacity to realize that what God was doing was bringing about a transformation, in a sense, a wonderful regeneration in the lives of his brothers, as well as bringing at least physical security to the whole Mediterranean world. I remember a friend who is a minister speaking at the funeral service of a young woman in his congregation who was the daughter of a close friend, telling us how she came to him at the end of one service. A young woman shriveled away, really, humanly speaking, far too early, and she said to him, I've begun to realize now it's not really about me it's not really about me. I sometimes think, since I'm a Presbyterian, there should be a question 1A in the Shorter Catechism. What is God's chief end? Because we have such a tendency to live with this question, what is happening to me, that you would almost think that the answer we are existentially giving is God's chief end is me. But God's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And our chief end is to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. And it's within that context that we're able to say, I understand what a blessed release this is for us, brothers and sisters, when we say, I realize this is not ultimately about me. And you can see that principle worked out in a multitude of occasions in the Scriptures, can't you? Again and again, you realize that what happens in an individual cannot be answered by the question, what is the explanation in my life for what God is doing to me? Because the explanation lies in somebody else's life. And so it was with Joseph. And then there's a third piece, I think, of the jigsaw puzzle that we should look at, and that is that God is not only working in a variety of individuals, but He is working out a variety of consequences in their lives. We've already hinted at this. Jacob brought at the end to confess, the Lord has been His shepherd all His life, and now He has spread before Him a table in the presence of his enemies. His cup is overflowing with joy. That alienation there had been between himself and the older brothers because of the younger brothers is all healed, and they are restored. And especially it's true in the lives of the brothers. What grace begins to emerge? They were, they were rightly irritated by Joseph. As we would say in Scotland, he cliped on them, cliped to his father and his own brothers. He, he demeaned them by telling them these visions that he was having. They were, he was given this special coat. They were jealous of him, irritated by him, and some of them wanted to do him in. And what happens in their lives? Well, they not only become conscious of their sinfulness, but Joseph ministers to them in a very bold way, doesn't he? It would be a very wise minister who worked out ways of doing this in his congregation. They have no idea that he understands everything they're saying. He says, okay, let's, let's give them a party. And of course, I don't sit with them because they'll, our own people, the Egyptians, will think that's… you don't do that kind of thing. They'll be suspicious. So, he, he, he says, now put them in this order. Uh, some of you are probably mathematically skillful, and you can tell the odds against selecting place names and putting people in the order of their ages if you don't know who they actually are, and he puts them all in their order of ages. And then, as the, as the servants come in with the plates, he, he says to the chef, make sure you pile high Benjamin's plate. And you see what he's doing? He is doing in a different context exactly what his father had done to him. Not a special robe, 
but a special plate, and he's watching the brother's reaction. And the brother's reaction is 180 degrees different. They rejoice and they make merry in the presence of Joseph. A renewal has taken place in their lives, and you see it in their relationship with their father. Alienated from their father, they are now saying to Joseph, our father couldn't bear it. Earlier on, our father couldn't bear it if we lost Benjamin. Please don't keep Benjamin. We're concerned for our father. And this astonishing expression of love for the father. And you see now how God has been sovereignly working out His purposes. But now if you do the calculations, He's taken more than 21 years to do it. He seems so slow. What age are you just now? I mean, some of us don't have 21 years. <laughs> we'll not see the end product. But you're 25. What, what, if you're, if, what if you're going to be 46 before you're able to look back and say, now I see that God meant it for good. You see, what this narrative is doing to us, it, as, as many biblical narratives do, it's, it's writing in capital letters the principles that God writes in lowercase letters into our own lives to teach us what He is like and that we can trust Him that He is never absent from His children, and He is never late in His purposes. And this is the wonderful thing that eventually Joseph is going to be able to discover. Uh, the Puritan minister from um, the English channel, John Flavel, uh, used to say that afflictions are like frosty days they are good for bleaching. That's mumbo-jumbo to you if you're under 40 probably, but I remember those cold winter days when the sun was shining, and my mother would say, this is a really great day for bleaching, and out would go the whites into the, the cold and the sun, and uh, they would seem to be dazzling white when they came in. Frosty weather, and Joseph had known many winters but you see, the great thing was this. He was now the right man, and he was in the right place, and he was at the right time. And God had done this amazingly despite and yet also through and in a sense because of the ways in which he had stumbled because he was holding on to his purposes in his life. Don't you think perhaps it's these words from which Paul got the, the biblical inspiration to write that God is working all things together for the good of those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose? So, yes, God is surely working together a variety of circumstances. And God is certainly working in a variety of lives, and He's certainly working towards a variety of consequences. And here is Joseph, and after 14 years, he's learned patience. After 14 years, he's learned humility. And even Pharaoh says, after 14 years, he is filled with wisdom. God's man, God's place, God's time, God's fruit. God's blessing, God's presence. And he's still the same. He's no different. He's the same for you and for me. But there's one final corner piece I want to draw your attention to. And in, from one point of view, it's not so evident in the story, but it's certainly very evident in the whole story and in the way in which the closing words are phrased. And the fourth corner piece of the jigsaw puzzle of Joseph's life is that God is always working in His people's lives so that eventually the Lord Jesus will be glorified. 
And I say that for a couple of reasons. One is because uh, this story fits into the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, doesn't it? Where God promises that in Abram's seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. The covenant promise that fulfills the promise of Genesis 3.15 and is fulfilled in Jesus Christ and has been fulfilled to us who belong to the nations of the world who have found our blessing in the seed of Abraham. But you remember how God says to Abraham, that seed is not going to come until the days have passed when you are brought down to Egypt and you go through darkness and your people are brought up again. So that Joseph, already we see in Genesis that Joseph fits into the story that is heading towards the Lord Jesus. But even more than that, I think it would be true that Joseph exhibits in the Old Testament what it is like for someone to be united to the Lord Jesus by faith, even although they see the Lord Jesus only dimly in the promise. What is it that happens? Well, the very same thing that happens to New Testament believers, that our Lord Jesus Christ is glorified in our lives as our lives are conformed to the pattern of His life as our union with the crucified and risen Savior works its way out into our lives by our sharing in His death and resurrection, our sharing in His sufferings and in His glory. That's exactly what happens to Joseph. The whole pattern of his life is a pattern of being brought down into desolation and death, and then being brought up in power and majesty in order to be like the grain of wheat that fell into the ground and died and did not abide alone but bore much fruit. Joseph bears this amazing fruit, and it's not only the fruit of him being, humanly speaking, the Savior of the Mediterranean area but the fruit of a transformed life that is so Jesus-like in the way it speaks. Think about this, my brothers and sisters, that there were those to whom the resurrected and exalted Lord Jesus could say, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many should be saved as they are today, So, these words are melting. So, says Joseph, do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to him. I mean, are there any words in the Old Testament that are more Jesus-like than these words? that He spoke kindly to them and comforted them. So, it's not only that He's a link in the chain that brings history to Jesus, points people to Jesus, but His very life breathes the atmosphere of someone who, knowing Jesus in the promise, has become like Jesus in His life, and whose life touches others and brings them to an experience of repentance and regeneration and faith and transformation and the most beautiful fellowship that must have been an amazing testimony to the people of Egypt. And so it is with ourselves. Rightly or wrongly, uh, many years ago, our young daughter, young teenager, had heard that there was a musical called Joseph and His Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, and so we got tickets to go to Edinburgh. It was a dangerous place if you live in Glasgow. We went to Edinburgh, and my wife was going to take him, but she was unwell, uh, take her, and so I, I, uh, I had to take my daughter. We, our seats were right in the front row. Uh, I have two vivid memories of that. One was, those of you who know the play know that at one point, Pharaoh turns into Elvis Presley. And I was the only one in the 3,000 audience who didn't know this. 
And so my daughter reminds me today of how embarrassing it was to sit next to the one person in the audience who guffawed <laughs> with astonishment at what was happening. And the other thing was that we were so near the front that we could see into the pit as well as onto the stage. And the conductor came on who had presumably conducted this musical, you know, a hundred times. 500 times perhaps, knew it forwards and backwards, seemed totally disinterested in what was happening was the first thing he did was he poured into a little bowl a large packet of M&Ms, smarty-like candies. And does he… he was… <laughs> and I thought, this is amazing that the drama that is going on up here is actually being conducted by a man who knows the score so perfectly. He is utterly relaxed about what he is doing. He's not put off. He's master of the score. And I thought maybe this is a terrible illustration, but in a way it is a real illustration, isn't it, of the confidence that we can have of the conductor of this Joseph symphony and therefore the confidence we can have in His ability to conduct all the affairs of our own lives. I wonder if in glory Joseph has already met that other believer whose name begins with the same letter, the Apostle John, and said this to him, John, you remember how you wrote about what Jesus said to Simon Peter when you were around the table at the Last Supper? I knew that long before Simon Peter knew it. You remember when he said, Peter, you do not know now what I am doing, but afterward you will understand. And what draws us to trust Him is these words, not, you do not know, but these words, what I am doing. And you can trust Him. And that's what this narrative teaches us. Capital letters in His life. Perhaps more difficult letters, perhaps not more difficult letters to read in your life, but He will hold you fast. He does know what He's doing, and you can trust Him absolutely. Let's pray together. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the sheer variety of ways in which You teach us through Your Word, sometimes in poetic songs that strike us as not only speaking to us, but speaking for us, sometimes in, in teaching that demands our full intellectual attention to follow the, the majesty of the reasoning of the gospel and to make it our own. And sometimes in the narratives of men and women, young people like ourselves, who have gone through long periods of your working upon their lives to fulfill your purposes for them, and we thank You that these things were written down of old for our instruction, and we pray that You would encourage us and strengthen us, that as these words sink deeply into our minds, our psyches, our emotions, as we see our circumstances through them, we too may be able to say, that because the Lord is our shepherd, because we know that He is with us, there is nothing for us to fear. So hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we'd all like to say, um, with Peter, on the Mount of Transfiguration to the Lord. It's been good to be here. It's good for us to be here. But like him, we have to go down the mountain again. And so we're thankful to the Lord for this evening. 
And we're going to close our meeting by singing a great hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. onwards and upwards in Wales to Aberystwyth. If you're able to join us there in person, we look forward to seeing you. If not, please join us online. Let's pray. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>